back a year ago. This episode of the Beer Bound Podcast is brought to you by Rolling Hops Beer Tours. Hey everybody, Garrett here from Rolling Hops, as always joined with my partner, Andy. We're here to tell you guys about our virtual craft beer tour offering. With what's going on in the world, unfortunately, we haven't been able to run our historical craft walking beer tour, so we've pivoted to taking the virtual experience of craft beer directly to you guys. Wonderful for team building events, corporate events, even just a, a night out or in for that matter with your friends and family and we're doing this online. Have any questions about the beer tours or want us to tailor make an event for you? Just shoot us an email or send us a message on any form of social media. Rolling Hops, you can find us everywhere. RollingHopsBeerTours.com is where you can get a hold of us and we'll see you guys soon. Cheers. Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. We're very excited to be joined by Alex Violette and Misha Smith from Pasture Street Brewing Company. We're dealing with a bit of a time difference for this episode as Pasture Street Brewing is located in beautiful Saigon, Vietnam. The birth of the brewery started with the idea to combine American craft brewing techniques with fresh local Vietnamese ingredients to create amazing craft beer. Named after the first tap rooms location, Pasture Street Brewing Company has since expanded into one of the largest beer brands in Vietnam. Throughout the company's growth, the vision of combining the best Vietnamese ingredients with professional American craft brewing know-how is still core to everything they do. I'm very excited to learn more about Pasture Street Brewing and how the craft beer market is developing across Vietnam. So without further ado, Misha, Alex, welcome to the Beer Bound Podcast. How are you both doing? Doing well. Doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to be on here. Yeah, thanks for meeting us. I know it's a little bit early for you, gentlemen, so I appreciate that. Maybe we could start off, uh, I gave a little introduction, but Misha, maybe you could start us off just a little bit more about you, how you made your way to Vietnam and your connection to, to beer in general. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the introduction was great. It sounds like uh, I could have written it Um, spot on. You hit all the, (laughs) hit all the highlights. Um, Yeah. So for me personally, uh, I, my, my kind of awakening to craft beer was uh, in actually in Toronto where you are. Um, uh, I got a job bartending at the uh, Mill Street Brew Pub uh, in the distillery district the first summer that they were open um and craft beer was still pretty niche in Canada at that point this is over over 10 years ago um yeah so then uh, I found myself in Asia I moved to South Korea for a while uh came here to Saigon on vacation a couple of times fell in love with the city uh went back finished my contract and moved here and then about a year and a half after I came to Saigon uh Pastor Street Brewing Company opened its first tap room I remember the day that I saw the ad on Facebook for Pasteur Street, I was really excited about, you know, American style craft beer because that was kind of the missing piece of the puzzle for me here in Vietnam was good craft beer. Um, so yeah, but it was it was an ad for, hey, next week we're open. I, I just found out about this. Now I have to wait a whole week to, to try the beer. Um, so yeah, I was one of the first people through the door the next Friday, that was uh, January 2nd, 2015, our first day. And yeah, I just I became a fixture at the bar, and then uh, three weeks later, I was uh, I was bartending one night a week for free beer at the tap room, um, and then it became more permanent. And then uh, the sales job came up a few months after that, and you know, seven years later, here we are. I love it, fantastic. And Alex, can you delve into your journey into the Vietnamese craft beer world? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's kind of fun. Um, just just the other day, I was going through some old phones and laptops, and we finally uncovered the um, the evidence that Misha was there on the first day. We had been looking for years to find a photo of him at the bar, sitting there all day. We finally found one, just like literally, like maybe a month or two ago. So, um, yeah, for me, I was um, I had been in craft beer for a while. Um, I, I originally got into um, 
you know, kind of craft beer for you utility, you know, uh, actually I was, um, you know, in university and went up to, um, my, uh, my roommate's hometown in Montana and I had never been exposed to craft beer before. And they were just like, dude, um, get your ID. Let's go to this brewery. And it's amazing. You'll love it. And this like the, there was a full tour and then tasting at the end of it. And, um, I had never thought about beer in that way before. And I think from there, I was just really interested in craft beer. And then, um, getting back, um, at university, you know, started, um, like playing around with brewing my own beer. I was a biochemistry student. Um, so that got me into like the, the beer side. And then that hobby turned into like, just full on career. And before I knew it, I was like, um, kind of, you know, abandoning the, uh, education path and going to, um, wash kegs at a brewery brought me to Colorado. I'm at Colorado. I meet my wife. And then she is at the bar at Upslope Brewing Company one day and meets, um, meets this guy, John, who um, is starting a craft brewery in Vietnam. So he had been out there for a while managing um, a nightclub for, I think, over six years. So he kind of had a really good lay of the land and he knew that his customers were, you know, asking for better beer options than what they could find. So um, came up with a business plan. Um, went back to the United States looking for somebody who was, uh, you know, versed in craft beer and just, you know, happened to stumble into the bar where my wife was working. We got introduced, hit it off. And next thing I knew I was in Vietnam. The rest is history. I like that. Maybe can we go back a little bit before either of you even set foot in Vietnam? Could you tell me a little bit about beer in the country? Obviously now in 2022, Vietnam is becoming a much more international country with folks coming from all across the world to the big major cities, but also just all in the entire country. It, it just is growing and is becoming a destination for the international community. But the Vietnamese traditions, I was saying before we started, I know I've been to Vietnam once and I know that beer is part of the Vietnamese culture. Can you can you sort of touch on how how you see Vietnamese culture and how that their interest in beer related to this sort of nouveau craft beer revolution that we're seeing? Is it blending well? Is it is it sort of two different worlds of your traditional beer and craft beer? I gave you a lot of questions, so I'll throw that out there and see what you guys could do with it. Yeah, I, I could attack the beer side ones, and then Misha is definitely the best one to answer the uh, the social side of it. But from the beer perspective, I mean, yeah, it's um, it's still, I believe, um, as of this year, ninety four percent of the alcohol consumption in Vietnam. So um, beer is, if you're drinking alcohol, it, it is most likely beer um, when you're in Vietnam. And there's um, there there is a lot of um, Oh, like drinking history. There's, um, you know, a tradition, I'm in Hanoi right now, and there's a tradition of Pia Hoi, where it is basically just very young, um, like almost like green beer, um, that it is brewed fresh and consumed almost immediately. As soon as it has got alcohol and it's ready to go, it's a fresh keg out on the street and very low cost, right? So, um, so you know, the quality, it may, it may be a little bit different every day, but it's beer. And, um, and it's very accessible to drink every day with your friends. And it's very much about like the social side, which I think that's where it leads into some of the Misha stuff. And then there's um, there's been also, you know, um, before we were pioneering these like American craft beer styles, um, there was like some imported Belgian beer and, and um, some smaller brew houses that did like a very like check take with like, um, they called it like a Bia Vang and a Bia Den. So just like literally yellow beer and black beer. But it was like a lot of these little places would pop up, but the beer was almost exactly the same in each one of them. And um, it, it, it was good. It, it was fresh, uh, you know, but it wasn't, um, you know, my favorite beers. I think that, you know, us coming in and adding like the, um, you know, the American style, like a style of craft brewing where it's, um, you know, going for some really spot on traditional examples, but also some really innovative styles kind of riffing on those. Um Yes, yeah, so that's kind of, I think, how the beer landscape came up um, from the way that I see it. And then Misha. Uh, you did ask a few questions all together in there. Um, I, but I, I tend the to do that. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> no, you're good. One of the things that popped into my mind as you're asking, uh, 
you know, I mentioned I lived in Korea where, uh, you know, soju was massively popular and often drunk with, not often always drunk with beer. Uh, you mentioned China where they have baiju. Um, you know, in Vietnam, they're like, you can get rice wine in some places, but it's not really part of the drinking culture to like sit around and have a big session on rice wine. It's, it's beer here. It's always been beer. That's the national liquor, like Alex said, but like 90 or 95, some insane percentage of all alcohol sales is beer in this country. So um, for sure, there was an opportunity to have a, a more premium selection of beer. And, uh, you know, at first, obviously at the tap room, it was a little, it was word of mouth. So it was mostly uh, guys like me, you know, expats who had found their home in Vietnam and knew about craft beers and missed it. Um, but it caught on with Vietnamese people pretty early on, uh, especially with our concept of using fresh local ingredients in all the beers. It was it was really interesting for them to come in. And, uh, Alex's wife, Bethany, was also behind the bar at the time with me. And she used to talk about uh, how awesome it was to see a Vietnamese person try an IPA for the first time and to just see the look on their face and like, oh, oh, beer can be this too? That's amazing. And uh, yeah, like Alex said before that, it was... The, the only real premium selection was some imported Belgian stuff at, uh, you know, a few bottle shops around town. But even that's not, it wasn't super prevalent. It was mostly, like I said, Biahoy, uh, obviously Tiger, Ba Ba Ba, uh, you know, San Miguel at the time was, was still pretty big. So, yeah, there wasn't really uh, a landscape of a more premium drinking selection in Vietnam. And uh, we provided it. Would you say that? Pasture Street Brewing was the first craft beer craft brewery in Vietnam. Is that is that fair to say? No, not no. fair. To I say. mean, I, no. I like whenever it comes up, we just kind of like shoot away. And saying like insisting that you're the first of anything is is just not true. There were other people brewing beer and and selling it on a craft scale. Uh, one I, I'd I'd love to mention because it always gets lost in the shuffle. Uh, Saigon Cider. Uh, this uh, British lady, Hannah Jeffries, uh, she was here making cider and selling it before any of the craft beer guys got started. And she always kind of gets lost in the in the telling of the history. So shout out to Saigon Cider. Uh, yeah, they were they were the first, I would say, like production, uh, you know, craft beverage facility. Like Alex said, there were some mm -hmm. like Czech style beer houses, but she was out there like actually selling kegs and bottles of her uh, of her cider. Right. But in terms of like, an, like, as you mentioned, sort of an American style craft brewery, do you see yourselves as sort of the first or, is, or no, there were that, you know, like, there was these guys, uh, Colin and Max, uh, they called themselves Fuzzy Logic and they had, uh, they had a craft IPA, you know, small production, but they were, they were selling to a couple of restaurants around town before we got started. Um, you know, like we were the first ones with our own tap room and with a, a range of beers that's, actually accurate to say but uh yeah i mean we don't like to get bogged down and like who's the first or who's the best you know we just try to do the best that we can every day and and focus on getting better yeah, if you're going for the first i mean there's so many little first you could try and pick out and say hey we're the first one of this or the first one of that but but really i think it's like we're all kind of um pioneers um at the same time pushing to um get more flavorful you know beer or cider options in front of people and it was very much a challenge at the time so like when we're talking to these guys we 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 know the struggles we were all there kind of um going through the same things at the time trying to or the same time trying to grow and um you know and running into a few different roadblocks i'm sure we were all um experiencing the same sorts of things at the time looking at the brewery now or the the brewing company i should say how expansive are you throughout the country so obviously you started in the big city to the south, Saigon, and now you can find your beer where? That was, I'd say, one of the areas we were really um, strong and pioneering in for, for craft beer in Vietnam is early on, we were um, very focused on getting our beer to wherever there was somebody who was willing to buy it. Um, and that was difficult at first, um, but as we got going, it... Um, you know, it turned into, uh, you know, something that we, we were doing that was unique and I think really helped to, um, to, to grow and um, make sure that, that we could get those beers out there. But we were doing things that, you know, we would, 
we, we would lose money on, you know, um, shipping these like one or two kegs at a time to these remote places. But we knew we were planting some seeds and getting some people the opportunity to try a beer that's probably way different than they've ever tried before. And we knew that would catch on and, and turn into five, 10, 20, 100 accounts, you know, in that area. Um, but it definitely was um, was a fun process trying to figure out all those logistics and, and make that work early on. And that, that's that's basically what Misha's role has been here. <laughs> Have you expanded outside of the country? Like, is can you find Pastor Street beer in other parts of Southeast Asia? or anywhere else unfortunately uh covid you know put a dent in uh, in a lot of our uh, export markets um but for sure we're still sending to the to the usa with our uh, our distributor there, lime ventures um malaysia's still going strong taiwan uh and then for the others that's my job right now is trying to get back to export with you know trying to work around the insane shipping costs that we're looking at right now and you know, just staying strong uh uh internationally but then of course we always come back to the fact that uh, we're a vietnamese brewery we were, we started the company here we're always going to take care of the domestic market first and foremost and make sure that we're staying uh staying strong locally you, you're asking about different uh places within vietnam just one of my favorite stories to tell obviously a uh, new audience with your podcast so sorry to whoever's listening who's heard it before um but there's this great little city called sapa uh, up in the mountains north of Hanoi, beautiful little city. Um, I had never been, but uh, I had a client uh, who had places in Hanoi and Hoi An who had uh, a couple places up there as well. And he, it took some convincing, but he convinced me to, to, that we should send <clears throat> uh, kegs up to his places in Sapa. So I went up there for the, uh, for the launch party and it was my first time going up. Loved it. And uh, we're there with the, the table of you know, all the other local expats, mostly working in F&B. Um, and this guy turns to me who had a hotel and he's like, hey, can, like, if it goes well here, can we get your beer at our place too? I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure. And he said, yeah, I've been trying to get Tiger to come up uh, for years. And you've been to Vietnam, you know, like Tiger is everywhere. Like you can see their signs, every street, everywhere, every city. It, Tiger's like the, by far the, the most visible uh, beer, commercial beer. So, so I turned to the guy and said, you can't get Tiger on draft here in Sapa? He says, no. And I had seen some Biahoy's on my way up. So I'm like, so if you want draft beer in Sapa right now, you can get Biahoy or Pastor Street Brewing Company Jasmine IPA, and that's it? And he says, yep, <laughs> like that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. It's amazing. So yeah, that was, like I said, one of my favorite stories of this whole journey was, uh, you know, getting our beers out to places where, other people may not want to go because we believe in what we're doing and we knew that there was a market there for it. It's a great slice of the market share up in Sapa. Mm. Yeah. Uh, would you say that your, who, who would you describe as your main clientele, your main customer? Would you say that you still do appeal more to the international crowd across Vietnam or do you see, do you see uh, it as a, a brand that's more accessible to the strong traditions of Vietnamese beer culture. The whole concept that John and Alex came up with to, to infuse all of our beers with, with a local ingredient, at least one, uh, you know, that, that has made us very attractive to, to Vietnamese customers. Obviously right now uh, there's no tourism to speak of. And we knew before COVID that uh, we needed to do a better job of reaching our, our Vietnamese customers. Obviously, the number of expats living here are finite, and uh, <laughs> Vietnamese people are, are everywhere you go. Um, so yeah, we had already started that shift in our marketing uh, well before COVID and all that. Um, and yeah, like you know, the the price point is a little higher than your, the local commercial loggers, or especially more than Bia Hoi. Um, But there's a there's a huge uh, like burgeoning middle class in Vietnam. We're very interested in, in different flavors, different uh, different experiences. And yeah, like Vietnamese people are really uh, um, experimental with flavors in their cooking. So then to bring that kind of ethos to, to the beer game, um, yeah, they're all for it. So, you know, we can throw out numbers or whatever, but, you know, if you go to one of our tap rooms on any given night now, it's just as many, if not more Vietnamese people in every single one, because you know, they've really embraced what we're doing and 
embrace just the whole craft beer experience of, you know, coming in. It's funny, when we first started, we've got these tasting flights of six beers. And when we first started, all the Vietnamese tables had, it was all just tasting flights. It was like, you know, family, like Vietnamese family style dining, you know, it's like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. But now uh, our Vietnamese customers are mostly regulars and I barely see any flights on the tables anymore. Now they've, they've all figured out which beers they like. They'll get a full pint. They'll sit there and, you know, drink and talk with their friends. And now they're doing family style on the food menu instead of all sticking with their, their favorite beer, whichever one it may be. That's really cool. And maybe Alex, can you touch a little bit about, go a bit deeper into the beer styles that you provide? Do you have a preference in terms of which styles you produce? Do you have to adapt? Do you have to adapt yourself to the customer, to the clientele a little bit in a different nuanced way? Or is it sort of you and others at the helm of what you decide to brew style wise? That was like uh, the big question that I had when I was just like, okay, I'm moving to Vietnam. I've never been to Asia before. Um, What's available? What are we going to brew? Started, um, you know, going through um, some of the stuff that um, I thought you could do better in Vietnam, right? Because I was thinking, like, um, if you're you're putting a brewery out there, you need to have a sense of place. Like, why is it that you're you're starting your brewery there? And um, this thing just kept going through my head. I'd been doing a lot of like, um, I was the uh, the head brewer at Upslope Brewing Company in Boulder, Colorado at the time, and um, we're right there, and kind of you know like the Brewers Association is right down the street, and the you know, the, you know, great American beer festivals there every year. So it's like, there's a really big beer scene. We're doing these collaborations with chefs and and it seemed like more often than not, they wanted to use like these really weird ingredients that, you know, it was hard to source and hard to get. And I was like, Oh, they all come from like places like Saigon. And it just kind of hit me that like a lot of breweries wanted to use like these, like these tropically grown ingredients in their craft beers in the United States, but there weren't a whole lot of breweries in those areas getting it really fresh. And like, I just thought that, um, you know, that that could be something that really gave us a sense of place because diving even deeper into it, um, I wasn't going to be able to get malt. I wasn't going to be able to get the hops, um, the yeast. Um, you know, we had literally would have to, you know, hop on a flight and go to like a homebrew shop in like Hong Kong or Singapore and get some ice, or, you know, a cup of ice at the airport and put the yeast in it and try and get it back to Vietnam. There was a, you know, um, but now it's like um, it very much we've got like great importers, but we were doing all that at the time. And um, so every beer was a challenge. We were trying to think of things like three months ahead of time to make sure that I could get the malt and the hops and all that stuff into the country. Um, but this idea of using um, these ingredients that go so well with beers that have like that culinary focus, it's like it was very much like the chefs that we were doing collaborations with wanted to use these ingredients. And um you know, it really grounds it. It gives it like the, the sense of place. Like, that's why we're here. We, this is what we do with our beers. Um, it's something unique. It's something that we can make, you know, a passion fruit beer, you know, like I, I would say we're going to be, you know, having a real strong leg up and making one of the best in the world when we can go down and choose our farm and talk to the guy. And they, you know, they've even recently upgraded and got their own centrifuge and processing equipment because we're buying enough juice to, you know, like, help them even like process it better. So um, yeah, it it just seemed natural that like we have an opportunity to brew things like a a Jasmine IPA or a passion fruit wheat ale um, and, and have kind of a leg up to maybe brew one of the best in the world. And, um, and at the same time, it's just like embedded in the, um, the, the agricultural tradition, the, the culinary flavors that you find in Vietnam, it makes the beers pair with the food really well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like our, our brewing ethos, and then um, and then like a lot of craft brewers, we do we do mostly ales. We'll do um, you know a lager here and there. Um, and Jasmine IPA is is by far our best selling beer. It's our flagship beer. Um, it's always awesome for me when I can go to places like Sapa and just see a can of it. Like where I'm just like just mind blown that there would be a craft beer selection. Some of the places we can go and get a Jasmine IPA. Um, yeah, we do, um, you know, uh, coffee and chocolate as well. We were um, very early on, very, uh, you know, fortunate. We made a great beer, but then had a little, you know, luck with the judges. And we actually won the um, the gold medal at the World Beer Cup for the best chocolate beer in the world, like a, a year after we had gotten started using some chocolate that was just, it was amazing. It was like a chocolatier that 
they were going out and not only picking the beans off the farm, they were talking to the farmers and saying, hey, plant banana trees and, and have more shade. And that'll make the quality higher. And when you go through the fermentation of the bean before you roast it, do this and this and this. And then, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, focusing on that, there's like herbs and spices, you know, like uh, with, um, you know, the, the food clock black pepper was one that we used early on and still use today. Um, but there's just a, a whole bunch of um, really great, um, you know, agriculture here in Vietnam that, that tastes awesome with beer. Yeah, certainly. I think that's really cool utilizing the local produce, the local, just the local resources that you have available to make just to bring extra quality, local quality into the beer you're creating. In terms of like your source main ingredients, where do you source that? Like, where do you actually, yeah. where do you get your, your, your malt? So it, your it hops started off with, um, with malt, there was um actually a, um, an importer that already had an import license with Weirman malts when we started. And, and they're a great malt house uh, based out of Germany. And I had actually used um, their malts frequently in the United States. So that was kind of like an easy start for me. It was just that um, the types, um, you know, cause they have a range of different, um, different types of malt and they weren't really importing those types yet, but I could at least place an order like three to four months ahead of time. And, um, if I placed the order, then would get it into the country. So it was a little um, odd for me because I was used to being in, you know, Boulder, Colorado, where if I need any ingredient, there's a warehouse right down the street. Just <laughs> drive a truck down, throw it in the back and pick it up. And here it's like plan your recipes out three or four months ahead of time. So, um, yes, yeah, so the malt was was manageable, but then the hops, um, it, it was very difficult to find. We actually had to get import licenses. Um as as our, our company just to like figure out how to get them in because we couldn't find anybody that was currently bringing them in um for you know each variety and and same trying to get um to get yeast in as well and it was very expensive it was hard to um actually you know produce a beer and then sell it even at the same price as you were selling in the united states and have that be something that works out financially in the end but we found a way to get through it and as craft beer starting to get more popular um you know, traditional importers picked up um, these vendors and now there's there's a great selection out here. So I guess that would include similar methods for getting hops and yeast, like just yeah. outsourcing. So, um, yeah, right, right now it's uh, the same as, um, you know, as brewers in the United States, you know. Um, sometimes I would, you know, I would, in the United States, for example, I would never buy malt directly from Vireman. You would buy it through a distributor that, that imported their malts. And um, it is very much the same, here now um the uh the the landscape has grown quite a bit there's i think the last time we checked over 70 craft breweries in vietnam and for me that's mind book uh, that's like uh, it's close to like 10 a year since we opened um getting started and um and yeah it, it's um it's it's turning into um a uh, i don't want to say I recognized but like a um you know, a segment of beer that in at least bigger um, cities, you know, a lot of like locals are kind of expecting to have an option of one, one type of that sort of beer available at the bars and restaurants that they go to. So it's getting there. And as, um, as it shows up in more and more menus, there's more and more, um, you know, people that might've been like me who are 20, 21 years old trying this stuff and then being like, man, I want to make it. And I think that, you know, it's getting wide enough to where we're going to see a whole lot of people, um, you know, kind of starting their own breweries, um, importing awesome ingredients, um, just the whole the whole range of things that you can do in craft beer. I think, you know, I can only imagine um, trying a Jasmine IPA after only having like a, a lager your whole life and then just being like, man, I think I'm into this. <laughs> do you see the new craft breweries popping up? Are they, is it, does it follow sort of an urban trend? Like, are they mostly popping up in Saigon and Hanoi? Or do you see, see more, more breweries latching on to maybe the medium or smaller size cities as well? I've, I've seen mostly, I mean, I live in Saigon. So I'm seeing mostly Saigon, but I also have seen some in Hanoi. And then I think Misha, do you, do you know of any that are popping up outside the, uh, the larger cities? I'm no, I mean, like there's Denang as well, obviously. Um, a Delat there. Yeah. Yeah. D Delat has one. 
Uh, <laughs> there's a new brand called Delat Cider, but I'm pretty sure that's produced in Saigon. <laughs> uh, okay, I was thinking, uh, okay, yeah, the one with honey in it. Oh, uh, no, that that's that's Saigon as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but the, with, with the lot, honey, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything goes through. Yeah, size. no, uh, I mean, so we went to a uh, a beer festival in uh, in Shanghai a few years ago, and there were definitely some breweries there where the guy was like, "Oh yeah, I live up. Oh, sorry, yeah, no, Delat, obviously, James James Relic up there at uh, Langbiang Mountain mm -hmm. Brewery. Uh, yep. So he's James. Uh, he lives there at the at the bottom of the mountain in Delat. Um, he's got a, a restaurant. They do like wood fired pizzas. And he brews his own beer and, and sells it on site. Uh, you know, it's a small operation; he doesn't distribute. But uh, yeah, he's he's making craft beers up there in the hills. <laughs> um, sorry, I forgot about that one. Um, but yeah, no, the the majority, the large majority, are Saigon, Hanoi, or Central Vietnam, either Da Nang or Hoi An. I'd say it's very uh, very hip too. You know, it's um, people looking looking to try something to have an experience. Um, almost like traveling you know trying to like taste something that's uh that's good it's like a real um it's like a fusion you know of like all of these different traditional beer styles from around the world that kind of got tweaked with like it, that american craft brewing culture and then you know retweaked with using all these like local ingredients and non-traditional beer stuff um and i think that's probably you know it's like i would be excited to try that if i was i was living out here so um a lot of uh, people like looking looking for new experiences, you know, like looking to taste something that they haven't had before, and um, and yeah, uh, I'd say probably the same sort of people that like um, have a you know like desire to like travel international or go uh, see something, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I think what you're doing is really cool. Just providing, just sort of bringing this sort of this craft beer boom that really probably has ignited in the United States and sort of spreads on into the world, but you're really bringing a local feel to it. I think that's, that's phenomenal. Just creating something new entirely. I have a question about the enterprise itself. Craft beer sort of has this association with being craft, with being a bit smaller. If you get almost too big, you're maybe not craft anymore, just sort of in that line of mantra. Do you see Pasture Street, do you see that as, do you see this as a very ambitious venture to, to become a, a really, I mean, you are, you do have such a strong presence in Vietnam, but do you really focus on growth and getting bigger and bigger, or perhaps you have a different philosophy of desiring a focus on something else? Yeah, I think like we're obviously we're we're gonna grow and get bigger. We're I mean, if you look at craft beer, we're, we've got to be like less than a tenth of a percent of the beer landscape in Vietnam, in a country where ninety four percent of the alcohol consumption is beer. I think there's there's plenty of room for a lot of people to grow, and I'm a very passionate believer in that. Um, that, that a lot of these uh, the, these people like experiencing craft beer for the first time, thinking about what they want to do when they grow up, what their career might be. Um, are going to go out and start their own breweries and add their own like flavor and twist to it. It's going to be the small startup guys that really help like drive the awareness of craft beer in Vietnam. They're going to be making these, these awesome beer styles from a just great perspective, you know, growing up and, you know, knowing like the places that they could go to and the, the things that they could drink and, and starting these breweries that have just really, um, you know, novel flavor combinations or taproom styles or branding approaches. And they're going to be behind the bar every day, talking to every customer and going out, providing great service and really making their friends fall in love with it. I think it's going to be the same way as it was in the United States with it being like a community thing where it's not like one brewery um, in craft that, that made it happen, you know, across the whole country. It was more of like a proliferation of the idea and small breweries starting up in in each of the towns and then each of the the you know that brewery exposing all the people in that town to the their new favorite beer and then you know um and then when you go and you're like at a a, a supermarket in the united states and, and you see something from california and then you can pick it up so i really see it being um of course we're going to be growing and we'll probably be growing at places that um 
that those uh, startup guys aren't at yet, probably in like a convenience store or a supermarket or exporting to a different country. Um, and I think it'll be the, very collaborative. I think that, um, uh, that just from what I've seen so far, it seems like it's working that way, where it's a very positive craft beer community. We're all supporting each other. And the the net benefit is we're, um, we're giving the opportunity for more and more people to try craft beer for the first time. And I think when that happens, you know, at least 10% of those people have got to have the desire to try it again. Maybe I can ask you two guys about just being, just living abroad, working in this really cool industry. What are, just in your daily life, it doesn't necessarily have to be within the brewery, but you can stick with that if you'd like. What are some of the the coolest, the, the greatest parts of, of living in Saigon and then maybe some challenges you face as well. Just maybe things are done a little bit differently. You mentioned Alex hard to source some ingredients sometimes. What are, what are the goods and the bads? <laughs> um, so the good, I mean, like I said, I was here for about a year and a half before uh, pastor street opened. And I just, I love the city, you know, like the, the energy, you know, I've traveled around a, a bit in my life. Uh, like I said, lived in Korea for a while, I came here on vacation. I just immediately was intoxicated by the, you know, the, the nightlife, the energy, just the, it, it felt, uh, just felt exciting to be here. You know, I, I, in this joke, I had this goofy grin on my face the whole two weeks I was here and nobody could knock it off. Um, and then obviously adding craft beer to that mix was just for me, like that was the, the missing piece of the puzzle. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been here uh, nine plus years now, and that kind of energy has never waned. You know, it just, I just, I, I love living here. I love, uh, I love working here. Obviously now uh, this, this dream job that I found, having uh, someone pay me to drink beer, uh, it's pretty great. So yeah, there's not, uh, there's not much that you're gonna get out of me that's negative about, uh, about living and working in, uh, in Saigon, Vietnam. Um, if I, if I had to say one downside is the, uh, it's the traffic police. The traffic police. All right. Alex, what about you? I would say, you know, the favorites are very easy for me. It's, uh, the people and the food. Um, yes. you know, I think it goes kind of back to what Misha was saying. It's like, you get here and there's an energy and you can see it. It's like every, everybody that you meet is excited. It's like Vietnam's awesome. We're doing great things. We're moving forward we're working together it's a very like um strong community spirit everybody's excited everybody's looking towards the future you know and um and that just kind of brings an energy to everything like you go out after work and you're in a good mood because you know your future is bright um and i think that kind of bleeds into like just the the whole culture and um probably even the preparation of a lot of the food um, but then yeah then the food for me is like it's amazing if you're looking to get something like delicious and healthy and just it's like all these great flavors and it's right there and you know like it, it can be delivered you know like even the delivery culture of food out here is amazing like it's just anything you want like you want to bun me it's like get on the app or call this number and 15 minutes later it's at your house and mm -hmm. it's just um i think a great combination of like people and food you know obviously like the beer but um you know, I think that's kind of outside. I thought, I thought you were just kind of asking about the general Vietnam um, experience. Maybe behind that, too, like um, there's a lot of beautiful nature um, in Vietnam. I never realized that it was 70 percent mountains. And then if it's not mountains, it's basically a beach. And um, been to some really cool places out here. And like I just never thought of like that, um, that aspect. I had thought of Vietnam more of like in the cities and the food, you know. And, um, but then realizing there's like a lot of great, just like mountains or exploring to do is pretty fun. Yeah. It's on a personal note. Yeah. It, Vietnam is a pretty special place for me. I've only been once, I think I was there for under two weeks, but it, it did the, the energy that you're talking about. I, I totally can connect with that. I think I traveled from Hanoi in the North all the way to Saigon and just the energy, the food was incredible. The people were so friendly and wonderful. The weather was amazing. The nature was amazing. It was kind of heavenly and felt a little bit like paradise. And it kind of opened my world. I hadn't traveled that much. And it really, 
it really ha held a strong impact on me. So it's a great place. Uh, we've had a lot of friends come and and visit while we've been living out here, and not a single one, has, I think, had anything bad to say. It's just um, it's very beautiful and friendly, and it's um, a great place to hang out. Here's my pitch for come visit Vietnam. <laughs> come to the craft beers <laughs> have a blast but no it's like it's like you get here and everything's okay like it, there's not a, an area of town that you could end up in that wouldn't be safe there's not mm -hmm. a food that you could try that wouldn't be interesting to eat um it's relatively affordable to get like nice hotels and travel around it's a a great spot to take a trip for sure so yeah just real quick story my buddy sean uh, came to visit from toronto a few years ago and literally uh, from landing at the airport in Saigon to taking a taxi to my apartment in uh, District 3 at the time, uh, he was like, as soon as I saw him, he's just like, dude, I get it. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, Saigon, you, <laughs> I totally get it. <laughs> and like, that was just from like, you know, zipping past the food set, the food vendors and like, you know, just like driving through the city. He's like, oh yeah, okay, this makes sense. So it's, and then of course we... <laughs> We got into exploring the city in, in more detail, but yeah, no, it's yeah. it's just it's a feeling you get when you land here, man. It's a it's a magical place. Yeah, it, it truly is. I sadly have only been once, and mm, hope to be back soon. Back. Yeah, well, I definitely will, and I'll definitely let you know. I awesome. I guess in terms of so you have the main tap room, which is still in Saigon. That's correct. You have a few other tap rooms. Is that right? Yeah, we've got four locations in Saigon currently, and one in Hanoi. So four in Saigon, one in Hanoi. Okay, so you're- yeah, We had one in Hoi An that we unfortunately had to shut down because of Hoi COVID and just not seeing anything coming back anytime soon. But uh, right. we do have plans to get back to central, either Da Nang or Hoi An soon. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it? You mentioned you can find pasture street brewing in other countries. Is it difficult to do that? Is it difficult to ship your product internationally just in terms it's... of regulation next door? No, like... I mean, it... It's, yeah. it's the cost is the biggest hurdle. Yeah. It's like the cost of shipping was always high. And now post COVID again, I feel like I'm talking about COVID a lot. Um, it's hard not to. Again, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it did a number. Um, but yeah, no, the shipping costs are even higher now than they would normally be. So that, I mean, as far as the licenses and the regulations, it's, it's pretty standard, you know, stuff gets shipped out of Vietnam all the time. So that wasn't a big roadblock to, to getting it street legal. It's really just the cost is the, is the biggest obstacle right now. Our importers and our distributors, they want to, they want to make the beer, you know, they don't want to make it cheap, but they want to make it affordable enough that it's not like twice the price of a local beer. Cause at that point, why would you drink an imported craft beer if you can get something fresher and, and closer, you know, like we, we see that in Saigon as well. Like people love local craft breweries. People have tried to import craft from other countries. It hasn't always gone great. So, right. and again, that's because not because the beer wasn't good, just the cost is so much higher for uh, for an imported beer. So, yeah, no, the uh, we've got a we've got a kid who uh, who handles all of our import export uh, paperwork and uh, and invoicing, and he he does a great job. It's it's always really smooth. It's just again, mm -hmm. the costs are prohibitive at this point. Yeah. What about even like next door? to Laos or Cambodia, is that difficult to, I don't know if there's easy networks of ground transportation, I don't know. I mean, you'd, you'd think it would be way easier because of the proximity, Yeah, but, but still, you know, there's still import taxes and, sure. uh, and, and different stuff to deal with. So it's, I wouldn't say Cambodia or Laos is any more or less easy or difficult than, uh, than any other country, which sure. again, you'd think because of the proximity, it would be super easy, but it's, yeah. It's not, there's still uh, some hurdles to, to, to get over. I mean, in terms of the actual production, so you have your tap rooms, but then all the brewing is done. Where is your actual brewery that's in Saigon as well in a separate location? Everything, yeah, is uh, brewed in Saigon, but, Just, but not in the city center. It's uh, yeah. further outside of town, yeah. Right. Okay. And Alex, in terms of the, like, the production scale, so you, you're head of brewing, is, you're the head brewer, that's correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, wear that hat as well. Yeah, that was, um, uh, it's, it's my favorite one to wear actually. Is that fair to say that you, that's sort of your main focus or do you get wrapped up with a lot of other 
I know you wear a lot of hats. So <laughs> well, how do you yeah, yeah. I mean, manage? Um, uh, how do you manage your time? Yeah. So um, it's, you know, that's, that's what I, you know, I'm a biochemistry background and I had been in the United States, like doing like being like the, um, the, the head brewer side and, you know, even laboratory, I've done a lot of stuff in the lab. Um, that side of it is definitely, um, you know, my background. So a lot of that side comes very easy to me. So, um, it's, it's what I enjoy doing the most, but it's also real, you know, like, Hey, this is blah, blah, blah. It's all set. And then the rest of it, um, with, you know, like we have tap rooms and we're expanding distribution and doing export in Vietnam. Like a lot of that stuff is new. So, um, and new for a lot of people, I mean, you know, um, you know, we're, we're not using the first, but between us and, and a few other people, a lot of things that we were doing was the first time that it was done. So it's like, you've got to figure out how to do that or how to, to get in. So, so um, making sure that um, we have our team that, that really understands the vision of what we're trying to accomplish here. And, you know, we have this, uh, this goal that we want to sell 20 million beers by the end of 2025 and making sure that we all are rallied around how we're going to do that by supporting a craft beer community, by finding new ways to get beer out to our customers and by focusing on the beer first, that's the number one thing. Um, making sure that, that we as a team, like uh, all are on the same page with that and that we all have the tools that we need to really move forward and get that accomplished. Um, it, it takes a lot, a lot more thought process, like a lot more mental space trying to figure out some of these um, these nuances of how we get there. But but that's also very fun, too. So that's great. Well, I know we're sadly coming up into our hour mark. I have so many more questions. I want to uh, dig deeper <laughs> to learn more, but maybe to end on something interesting, maybe both of you, could you share anything particularly so, something that you find special about Pastor Street Brewing or craft beer in Vietnam that we haven't touched on? Maybe just any other final points you'd like to share? So anything like, uh, I mean, I actually, like it, at the end of the day, I think it's um, really special just to be here. And um, I'm, you know, every day that we go out and we do this, I'm, I'm very thankful that, that people appreciate what it is that we do. You know, it's like you come and you're starting a business here and like you're you're a guest and you're like, hey, I'm going to make these crazy beers and, and I want to throw this flavor at it that, that the style of brewing mm -hmm. that, that will make it something that that you can only do best in Vietnam. And and what do you guys think? And and it's awesome every day seeing like more and more people actually like, you know, uh, appreciate that, that these beers are here and that the scene exists. So, I mean, I guess. I'm just like uh, yeah. thankful that that that's something that people are into and that you can provide that for them. I got I got something for the. <laughs> Misha, you're you're up. It's you're up. To <laughs> so yeah, um, you know something that we talked. So when when I first took over the sales job uh, in, I think it was October 2015, um, it was really tough, man. You know, like a lot of places had exclusive draft uh, deals with with the bigger beer companies. And at the time we didn't have cans or bottles. We were only doing kegs. So, you know, like it, it was really hard back then. And it was, um, you know, it was a lot of work on our part, obviously, and, and the other craft brewers at the time. Um, but then it, it was, it was the customers who really made a difference, who, who started asking places, well, why don't you have a craft beer on tap yet? Like what everyone else is getting it together. Like what's, what's your problem? What's your story? So then it, all of a sudden it's like, these places were convinced, well, we can't take this money for this exclusive draft deal because we need to have at least one craft beer. And then once they got one on and saw how well it did, like, well, now we to get more on. And now if a new bar or restaurant opens down, it would be weird. It would be really weird if they didn't have at least one craft beer selection. Um, and, you know, that, that all changed in a pretty short period of time. And for me, uh, for us to have played a big part in that, that's just one of the coolest things, uh, you know, I can think of in my life is that, you know, we were part of changing not just the craft beer scene, but the beer industry in a country that is so beer dependent, like beer, beer dependent, beer loving, like Vietnam. Um, it just, it, you know, you, you can, it's easy to get lost in like the day to day and like, you know, what meetings do I have today? What am I doing? When you like step back and look at the big picture of, of what we've done as a team, what we've done as an industry, with our other uh, 
other local craft brewers. It's just, it's amazing. It's astounding. Like it, it's really, it's just really cool to think about uh, where we were and where we are now. And then, you know, potentially where we're going. I can really tell just from this short conversation with both of you gentlemen, you're very passionate and you're making me really want to visit Saigon now. And, and tattoo? what's no, that? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you want to see my passion? <laughs> I do. Do you have one? No, I'm joking. <laughs> All right. The next time we talk, I hope you'll have one. Yeah, I'll definitely, I hope in, in the near future to make uh, another return and I'll definitely reach out to you guys. Would love to, to visit and to sample some of your, some of your beer because it, it sounds fantastic. Yeah, Alex Misha, I really appreciate your time. Uh, Pastor Street Brewing Co., Saigon, Vietnam. Make sure to check it out if you're ever there. Guys, thanks so much and look forward to chatting again next time. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay, thanks. Cheers, guys. See you in Vietnam soon. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.